Okay, welcome to today's On This Day in Tudor History. Now, I've actually got my notes here because we were going to go and film outside, but it suddenly clouded over and got rather chilly, so I'm inside. Right, where am I taking you back to today? Well, I'm taking you back to the reign of King Henry VIII. For On This Day in Tudor History, the 11th of April, 1533, Good Friday, Henry VIII informed his royal council that Anne Boleyn was his rightful wife and queen and that she should be accorded royal honours. The following day, the pregnant Queen Anne Boleyn attended the Holy Saturday Mass with all the pomp of a queen, clad in cloth of gold and loaded with the richest jewels. A real statement of her status as Henry VIII's queen. While the king was ordering his council to do this, his new Archbishop of Canterbury, the newly consecrated Thomas Cramner, was working on the king's great matter, as it's been called, the annulment of his marriage to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Now, being recognised as queen and appearing in public as queen was a huge deal for Anne Boleyn. I mean, she'd been waiting to be Henry VIII's wife and queen since his proposal back in 1527. Neither of them could have known that it was going to take this long for it to happen, that it was going to take that long to get his marriage annulled and for them to be married. Why do I say that? Well, because Henry VIII wasn't actually asking the Pope for anything that unusual. In the 12th century, Louis VII of France had asked the Pope for his marriage to Eleanor of Aquitaine, um, which had produced only daughters and no male heir, to be annulled, and the annulment had been granted. In more recent history, as in recent to Henry VIII, Louis XII had had his marriage to Joan of France annulled by the Pope so that he could marry Anne of Brittany. So, you know, that's, it wasn't unusual for the Pope to grant annulments to rulers. But things were a bit different in King Henry VIII's case, though. Although he and his canon lawyers could argue that the dispensation um, that had been granted by Pope Julius II was not valid because the Pope shouldn't overturn God's law, um, Henry's wife, Catherine of Aragon, was opposed to the annulment, and very vocally so, and she appealed to the Pope and also to her nephew, and her nephew was Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, the most powerful man in Europe. And Pope Clement VII, the man who was Pope at this time, could not really afford to upset the Holy Roman Emperor. He, he was between a rock and a hard place. How could he please Henry VIII and Charles V? He couldn't. If he granted the annulment to Henry VIII, then Charles V might rise up. Um, if he didn't grant the annulment, then Henry, the VII, Henry VIII wasn't happy. So ugh, a, an impossible situation. So the Pope kind of played along with things. Um, in 1529, a special legating court opened at Blackfriars in London. The court's purpose was to hear the case for the annulment. It was presided over by papal legate Cardinal Lorenzo Campeggio and also Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, who'd been made Pope Clement VII's vice regent in 1528, especially for uh, this case, to take cognizance of all matters concerning the king's divorce. Unfortunately, this legating court was adjourned in July 1529 for what was supposed to be a summer recess, but it never actually reopened as Catherine of Aragon appealed her case directly to Rome. She felt that uh, she wasn't going to get any justice um, in this uh, legating court and she appealed to Rome. Henry VIII was, of course, bitterly disappointed. He thought that this uh, court at Blackfriars was going to grant the annulment for him. 
and his disappointment with his advisor, Cardinal Wolsey, put the cardinal in quite a shaky position, it made him very vulnerable. And the cardinal's enemies, he had quite a few, were able to paint him as a man who was stalling over the annulment and who was actually in the pocket of France as well and was not working for the king's best interests. Wolsey ended up being called to London to face charges of Premier, but he died on the way. He died a natural death on the way, on the journey. In 1531, with the help of his new advisor, his new right-hand man, Thomas Cromwell, Henry was granted the title of Singular Protector, Supreme Lord, and even so far as the law of Christ allows, Supreme Head of the English Church and Clergy. And in September 1532, Anne Boleyn, his sweetheart, was raised to the peerage, being made Marquess of Pembroke in her own right. The couple then had a very successful trip to Calais to meet with King Francis I. They gained Francis I's support for their plans to marry, and they may even have married in secret on their return to England on the 14th of November 1532. Then on the 25th of January 1533, they had another secret ceremony, but this time more official at Whitehall Palace. And although they might not have known it at the time, Anne Boleyn was pregnant at this wedding ceremony. On the 30th of March 1533, Thomas Cranmer was consecrated as Archbishop of Canterbury. And on the 5th of April 1533, convocation determined that the Pope was wrong. Pope Julius II had been wrong in issuing a dispensation for Henry VIII to marry his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon. On the 9th of April 1533, Catherine of Aragon was informed that she was no longer queen. She was demoted from queen to Dowager Princess of Wales. Um, and on this day in 1533, Henry VIII informed his council that Anne Boleyn was his wife and that she was queen. On the 23rd of May 1533, a special court annulled Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. On the 28th of May 1533, the Archbishop of Canterbury proclaimed that Henry VIII's second marriage to Anne Boleyn was valid. This was victory at last. After waiting since the proposal in 1527, this was victory at last for King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. And they set about celebrating this victory in style with a lavish coronation at Westminster Abbey, which followed three days of pageantry, processions and celebrations. So at least six years of waiting and then victory. And then just three years, three short years as queen. It seems so very sad that all of that, everything they went through, just culminated in Anne Boleyn being brought down and executed. Now in the description, I'm going to give you a link to a timeline that I made of Henry and Anne's relationship between 1528 and 1533, so that you can see the main events leading up to Queen Anne Boleyn actually being recognized as Henry VIII's wife and queen. By the way, this date in history, the 11th of April, 1533, the date when Anne Boleyn was officially recognized as queen, is recorded in the amazing painting by Hans Holbein the Younger called The Ambassadors. Um, this painting portrays two ambassadors, Jean de Danteville, um, who was an ambassador of Francis I of France, and Georges de Selve, um, another ambassador. Um, those who have analysed this painting, and actually when you see this painting there is so much to take in, those who have analysed it have found that the date on the celestial globe, um, which is also the date on the quadrant and the cylinder sundial, are all the 11th of April 1533. Um, historian Eric Ives wonders if this painting by Holbein was actually commissioned by Anne Boleyn, um, which kind of does make sense because she, her family did act as patrons to Holbein. She'd commissioned things from him before, like for her coronation, um, she went on to um, commission him 
for a tableau for her coronation. She commissioned him for gifts for the king. There was a link between Anne Boleyn and Hans Holbein the Younger. Um, it's an incredible painting and it's rich in symbolism and messages. So I'll give you a link to a series of articles that I did on the painting exploring its symbolism. Interestingly, in May 1536, one of the ambassadors featured in that painting, Jean de Dantville, um, attempted to intercede on behalf of Sir Francis Weston, who was one of the men accused of sleeping with Queen Anne Boleyn and who, of course, lost his head in May 1536. Uh, so this ambassador petitioned the king on behalf of Weston, um, but his petition was sadly unsuccessful. Also on this day in Tudor history, the 11th of April 1554, in the reign of the Catholic Queen Mary I, Sir Thomas Wyatt the Younger, son of poet and diplomat Sir Thomas Wyatt the Elder, was beheaded on Tower Hill after being found guilty of high treason. He had led Wyatt's rebellion against Queen Mary I. And you can find out what happened in last year's video, which I'll give you a link to. Now you can subscribe to this channel by clicking that subscribe button there. You can give me a like and leave me a comment and you can always hit the bell to be notified as these videos go live. I'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye bye.